Today, we have with us Vivek Vishvanathan, who spent nine years at research affiliates as a quant researcher. And then he spent seven years at Radiant Global Advisors as the head of research and portfolio management, uh, one year at Delphi FIA uh, as the head of quantitative research, and he's currently at BTG Pactual as a quant PM today. So thank you so much, Vivek, for being here. <laughs> thank you. The first question I always like to start off with is, I feel like there's a lot of stereotypes associated with quants and curious as an actual quant, what are some of the unusual things about your work or about your background that people might be surprised to hear? Yeah. So one somewhat unusual part of my background is I came from an econ and finance background instead of a more traditional quant background that might be more focused on math, physics, or computer science. That was originally a hindrance, I think, because practically the most important thing you need to know is how to code. However, I think in mid and low frequency quant equities, which is what I'm primarily specialized in, having that finance background is actually extremely helpful for one big reason. You have a much better sense of which proposed ideas are most likely to work. So for example, if you have a cross-sectional equity strategy and you're trying to implement some sort of forward-looking vol control, your first thought is looking at aggregate implied vol, since that will be sufficiently highly, highly correlated with individual equity volatility that it can serve as a good first pass. If you're looking to predict underlying financial variables, you'll know that the market responds more to sales and earnings than to operating cash flow. And that is a result of financial accounting making earnings as relevant a variable as possible. That knowledge is actually useful. And I think it's harder to pick up on your own than coding and machine learning, which there are currently a ton of resources online for. So I did have to pick up a lot on my own, but those things were a lot easier to pick up in my mind than all the sort of financial theory, which generally you have to pick up from books. For sure. That's such a great point. And, you know, coming from an unusual background as well, it's a, that's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a, an interesting point you make too. I think that the industry these days, like having coding knowledge and everything is, it must be so, so important. Speaking of that, I'm curious on what your day-to-day -day job is like these days, uh, as much as you're able to share, whether that's just the divide between research or meetings, mm -hmm. you know, actually doing stuff, trading, portfolio management, I uh, would be curious yeah. on what you're focused on. <clears throat> Absolutely. So throughout my career, my day-to-day -day has changed considerably. There was a period early in my career where most of my time was spent writing papers for practitioner journal publications doing exploratory research that was many steps removed from trade implementation and doing creative custom analytics. Now, everything I do is focused on this simple idea of what is the next thing that I can do that will add the most risk-adjusted return to the board, right? Because I'm setting up a new strategy currently, that involves an outsized amount of data and infrastructure. But in, in normal times, it's something like 5% infrastructure, 25% data, 30% feature engineering, and maybe 20% uh, machine learning and optimization and 20% trade implementation. Obviously, that's an approximation, but that's how it roughly splits out. Nice. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe curious about what are some of your favorite books or videos, podcasts, newsletters, et cetera, that uh, you've enjoyed yourself? Yeah, as far as quant podcasts, Corey Hofstein's Flirting with Models is excellent. So de depending on the particular guest, you can actually get useful, practical, implementable knowledge there. On a non-quant related note, Goldman Sachs Exchanges is good for general financial news. For newsletters, Justina Lee's Quant Newsletter is good because it gives a list of recently published or uploaded quant papers. And so what you can do there is you can just like quickly scan through and figure out if there's anything that's relevant and read up on it or not as the case may be. So those are the three things that I, I generally use. Most of the books I read are not quant related, right? I'll just like read fiction or something like that. Or if it's nonfiction, it's like history and stuff like that. So I, I don't have any top of mind books. Amazing. Yeah. I was going to say there's lots of great resources out there. And yeah, Justina's newsletter is amazing. <laughs> it's really nice to see a really thorough newsletter and just listing all the resources every week on what's going yes. on stuff. Yeah. Yes. That's been really cool to see as well. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Any career advice that you would give to people entering or trying to enter the quant industry today? 
Yeah. So being as old as I am, so I, you know, I've been in the industry for 17 years. I'm 40. I'm probably too far away from knowing how to break into quant, but I can give some general thoughts. The one thing I know is it's way harder now than it used to be. I think part of the reason is coding efficiency is much higher now due to off the shelf solutions and coding assistant tools. Just to give an example, I began trading a strategy built from scratch in two and a half months, which is one other colleague who joined six weeks into the process. So that would not have been possible five years ago. Definitely wouldn't have been possible when I started 17 years ago. There's a lot of commodified coding that is much easier now than it was previously. And frankly, when I joined 17 years ago, I was just doing that commodified coding, all the stuff that you can get easily in a library. You can just ask ChatGPT to, to write up. And so the fact that you can't just come out of undergrad and, and do all that like very basic stuff is an impediment. That being said, I, I think there are a few things to consider as someone trying to break new quant. So first is not every quant job is at Jane Street, Rentech, and Hudson River Trading. There are quant jobs at large firms that don't primarily do quant. There are small quant firms. There are quant jobs that predict over a longer horizon. There are quant jobs that focus on every asset class you can think of. Their buy side quant jobs, their sell side quant jobs. And yes, you would have gotten paid more working at Jane Street or Rentech, but you could still make good money working somewhere else, doing interesting work. So one recommendation is just expand the pool of possibilities. You don't need to get in at a tier one firm. And it is the case that the best time to get in is right out of undergrad, right? It gets increasingly harder as your uh, career goes on. Like, you know, if I applied to Rentech right now, I would get automatically rejected instantaneously, right? It's not even, you know, <laughs> worth doing, so to speak. And second, if you believe you're skilled, and you don't have to do this right out of the gate, but, uh, you know, at some point, if you believe you're skilled, it's better to work at a place with a P&L cut and a, at a place that's either trading with their own capital or at least in the job involves very little marketing or client interaction. So like work at a multi-pod shop where you're insulated from any of that work. Practically, you might only achieve this later in your career, like I did, and that's fine. You don't need to have everything right out of the game. But so why are P&L cuts important? Right? It's not just because like, hey, if you do well, you make a lot of money, which happens to be true. But having a P&L cut keeps you focused on the right thing. So I've worked at places where comp was completely discretionary. And it's incredible what people will focus on. So a research idea might just catch someone's fancy. It might just seem particularly interesting or compelling. It might be a feature with a fascinating story or a new technique that seems fancy or cool or interesting data set or whatever it might be. If you have a PNL cut, you will be entirely focused on how to increase profit and mitigate the risk of losses. And if I were to come up with an idea that my colleague or employee did not think was the profit maximizing thing, they will tell me, right? They will say, look, is that the thing that we want to focus on here? That just makes things very clear. Also, in general, if you can, it's easier to work at a firm trading their own capital than one trading client capital. The reason is you spend a good amount of time on analytics and communication instead of improving the strategy. It's actually very hard to get away from this because even if you are just trying to focus on improving the strategy, someone's going to ask you, well, how does this new technique work? And can you describe it in a way that clients can understand? Can you produce some analytics related to it? So on and so forth. So that ends up becoming a massive time suck. And it takes you away from the value adding activity of just generating alpha. That's such a great point for my hedge fund experience as well, by the way. I think one thing that I never had predicted and I wish I'd known was that over half of our company's time, you know, half of anyone's time in the company is spent on investor related stuff, reporting yes. to investors or compliance mm -hmm. because we have investors, then we have to deal mm -hmm. with compliance related stuff, you know, regulatory reporting. We have to deal with the SEC and the NFA and all the other regulators. We have like what, six different regulators, <laughs> you know, so dealing with all of that and underestimating just how much work that is, it's twice as much work to be a hedge fund structure. And so in a hedge fund, I think you'll notice that yeah, if someone joins a hedge fund, right? You'll notice half the team is doing stuff that you're like, wait, what? Like you have a communications person in the company. <laughs> There's all kinds of roles. You're like, 
this role exists like what <laughs> you know but yeah where versus a prop shop i think it can be a lot more hyper focused on you know at least the things that to a quant researcher are, are important or focused on helping the researchers be able to generate more alpha creating an environment gotcha. that lets the researchers actually focus and concentrate on things and they're not being similar to startups that raise vc you know when they're being pulled around in different directions by maybe some vcs who want them you know, depending on how active they are same with the cash funds you know their investors the lps in the fund might pull them in different directions and have different expectations expectations that you're just like, well, what is this? <laughs> you know, you brought up such great points there as well on all, all the career advice on entering this space and how I think you're right. It's been more difficult than <laughs> what it used to be and stuff too. Thanks for all that. And yeah, and also a great point that not every firm is you know, Renaissance technologies in, in this industry, mm -hmm. right? But that there's still like, there's a lot of amazing career paths in this space. And I think Quant has become a lot more broad, it sounds like, than what it used to be. And and uh, yeah, it's really incredible to hear. <laughs> Just as a final question, what trends do you think will happen with the quant trading industry over this next decade or so? Yeah, so I don't think I'll be saying anything that anyone doesn't already know, but I, I expect machine learning to become increasingly important, even more so than it already is. The ability to encode text as features will become increasingly important. Trading and information incorporation will become faster as it has over the past couple of decades. The alphas of today will get arbitraged away, requiring increasing sophistication. But I'm just saying all the pre-existing trends that have already existed. So some other thoughts are, I think multi-strategy approaches will become more popular. So they seem to be the most consistent performers. This is largely due to diversification. Maybe slightly more controversially, I expect single pod multi-strategy approaches to become more popular. So this is, you know, shared PL across the group running uh, many different strategies across uh, many different asset classes. I think there, there are two reasons why this is. There's a lot of value in shared information between groups. So th that's reasonable. And so fully isolating pods can create suboptimal models. And the second thing is you have this issue of p l cuts in multi-pod, where let's say one pod is up 20%, or, or let's just put it in dollars, right? One pod's up 20 million, the other pod's down uh, 20 million. You still need to give a p l cut to the plus 20 million pod. And so you end up being net negative. With the single pod multi-strategy, that sort of solves that problem. So that's a bit of a guess, right? My job is in predicting where the quant industry is going. So I, I don't actually know if that's going to be accurate, but I, I, I think uh, that's something that could be strong value add going to. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and yeah, I agree. I think that'd be an interesting direction to see the space going in the future. So cool. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show with us and definitely look forward to following you. And uh, I'll make sure to also, by the way, I'll post all the info about your LinkedIn and whatever other profiles that you'd like below as well. So people can take a look and make sure to follow you. But yeah, thanks again, everyone. And I hope everyone has a great day ahead of them. Thank you. It was a pleasure.